Hi everyone. Um, something that comes up fairly often in discussions, particularly around um, medieval and ancient warfare and weapons and armour, um, is the assertion that people in um, earlier historical periods were smaller than now. Um, now firstly, um, this is a, a very general uh, statement to make, um, and it's uh, partially true and partially untrue. So, um, in actual fact, the first thing to say is that um, we have a lot of um, statistics for um, the size of people within certain areas over really quite long periods of time, thanks to um, two main factors. One is archaeology, so we have, we have the bones, we have the skeletons of people. And the second thing is, in regards to um, armour specifically, we actually have the armour surviving. And you can tell a lot about the size of people who wore armour by looking at the armour, because of course the armour was very, uh, particularly in the, the, you know, the plate armour period, so the, the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, um, the armour is very close fitting, uh, and it has to be to, to function properly. Um, and so you can tell a lot about the size of, of the people wearing the armour from the armour itself. Um, and, you know, you can mount the armour in slightly different ways, um, uh, with, you know, slightly bigger gaps or slightly smaller gaps between different pieces. And so you can vary the overall height, um, for example, of, of an armour. Uh, but you can nevertheless get a pretty good idea about the size of a person from the size of surviving armours. So for the 14th to 17th centuries we, we've got quite good um, statistics of, of armoured people and for other historical periods um, of course we have the skeletons. Now in um, the United Kingdom we're lucky to have uh, both a lot of archaeology going on um, and a, a very long archaeological record uh, but we're also very lucky to have a lot of um, organisations putting together statistics like, for example, the Museum of London, um, who have um, you know, compiled and, and published lots of statistics of um, skeletons from Roman right the way through to uh, medieval and Renaissance um, skeletons from cemeteries in London. So we can actually say quite specific things about the size of historical people. Um, and what, what do those stats tell us? Well, they tell us that in actual fact, um, if you look at uh, Anglo-Saxon men, for example, from, from the uh, sort of 6th through to the uh, 10th centuries, um, the average male height that I've seen um, listed when I was a, um, an archaeologist and an archaeology student was 5 foot 8. Um, uh, when I was at university, about 15 years ago, uh, the average height of UK males then was 5 foot 9. So there was only an inch difference. Um, but what was notable, and these are, these are statistics from London and the south east of England, um, was that um, as populations increased in um, population density, uh, so civilized, basically as, as settlements increased in size, and essentially as uh, living conditions in, in cities at least um, probably became not quite so good and diet became not so good, perhaps slight rise in childhood disease, um, spread of adult disease as well and um, uh, sanitation in terms of um, sewage and, and so on. So as, as settlements grew in size and sophistication um, it does seem that there was a decline uh, to some degree in average height. So, um, there does seem to have been a general decline in, in average height of people um, through the medieval period and reaching a sort of all-time low in the Industrial Revolution um, of the, of the um, sort of late 17th through to the, through to the early, uh, late 17th century through to the early 19th century. And thereafter, the effects of improved understanding of um, dietary requirements uh, uh, sewage networks being built, drainage uh, systems being built, um, and, and modern medicine coming in in the 19th century, um, then the average height increased again, um, such that you know by by the sort of First World War, um, Britain's um, average height was. 
pretty good compared to most parts of Europe, although interestingly the average height of Americans and Australians during the First World War was um, taller than um, Europeans because people living in sort of colonial countries where there was perhaps better diet and better living conditions because of less overcrowding at that point. Um, so, um, essentially it is true to say that people in the medieval period um, were on average smaller than today um, and people in um, the ancient world were on average smaller than today. Um, however, we have to add a very important factor into the discussion on people's size um, that tends to get overlooked in these discussions and that is that modern um, ways of living and the fact that we all tend to eat the same kind of food as each other and we tend to all have uh, access to the same kind of modern medicine as each other means that modern populations seem to be more um, homogenous or more equal in terms of their their uh, sort of sizes on average so um, although our average is a bit bigger than previously our range our variety is less than before and if you look at um, medieval populations for example you'll see a lot more people who are have very stilted very stunted growth so more what we might call um, you know dwarves people very short people small people um, but equally you get um, you get more um, giants for example as well people who are uh, above well above the norm uh, so the variety due to due to the lack of modern uh, science the lack of modern medicine uh, seems to have varied more but equally there seems to have been more variety because of essentially selective breeding within groups as well so for example people traveled less so if you had a particularly tall population in Yorkshire in England for example I'm not saying this is the case but just imagine that there was a particularly uh, tall group of people um, within a village somewhere in Yorkshire um, they might have completely different physical characteristics to a group of people living in Suffolk in England because at that period of time, in, in the medieval period, there was much less movement and intermixture of people from different areas. So it was more likely that you would get um, a, a particular physical characteristic, whether it's blonde hair or um, brown eyes or darker skin or lighter skin or being taller or being um, broader um, these kind of differences in physical characteristic it's more likely that they would have been more localized in historical periods because people mixed less than they do today people moved around less um, but equally within social status there would have been less intermixture as well so whereas in the modern world everyone essentially it well except for the one percent of the population who, who own most of you know the vast majority of the world's wealth um, most of the world's population are sort of upper working class lower middle class most of us go to work uh, have a job and most of us are able to socially mingle with people of other social statuses and uh, perhaps marry them and perhaps breed with them um, in the medieval period or in the ancient world for example it um, was far more, um, uh, there were far more stratified layers in social class such that um, it would be very unlikely uh, most of the time for a, a farmer, for example, to marry a noblewoman and have children with her. Um, so for this reason also, in medieval and ancient societies, you tend to get a bigger, a bigger physical characteristic differences between different social classes. Um, and I think that there's a fair amount of evidence to suggest that in Europe, um, for example, um, in the medieval period, the nobility often enjoyed slightly higher um, average height than the, than the working class populations. And this was perhaps partly due to, to diet and, and, and healthier uh, childhood and more nourishment as children but perhaps also to do with selective breeding to, to a degree because obviously if you're a rich nobleman and you can pick your wife um, amongst the, the many options you have you can, you can pick the, the, the fittest looking, uh, nicest, prettiest looking, tallest, strongest woman uh, that you can find around and you can have lots of children with her and you can populate 
Uh, you can produce lots of children because you can support lots of children and more of your children will survive to themselves uh, be able to um, reproduce and prosper as well. So there's many factors involved in this um, topic and I'm very far from being an expert on it uh, but I thought I should say something about it because it does come up a lot in discussions of weapons, weapon sizes uh, and also different uh, cultural groups uh, fighting other cultural groups. Uh, and it is noted, if you look at historical sources, that sometimes one cultural group is described as being bigger or stronger or more, more imposing than another cultural group, uh, even up until the 19th century, and in fact even up until World War I. Um, and there's a very famous photo you can find uh, from World War I of many different nationality soldiers standing in a line showing the different sizes. For example, um, there's a very small Japanese soldier in there and there's a very tall, um, there's a very tall British soldier in there. Um, so it's an interesting topic, um, uh, and, but there's many facets to it. It's not as simple as sometimes people make out. Thank you.